I should begin by saying I have no conflict of interest, at least none that I'm aware of. I've certainly had no money from anyone other than the University of Nottingham for quite some time. Um, this talk is, is looking at theoretical risks. It's completely speculative. Um, and I, for anyone in this audience who's ever picked up a biology textbook, and certainly anybody who's studied biological sciences or medicine, you will find this extremely simplistic, and I apologize for that. But anyway, here goes. Um, so I want to look at likely health risks, and I thought, how do I get this to... I, I'm not going to talk about the health risks that come from products exploding and all that sort of thing. We could spend 20 minutes wondering what it is about electronic cigarettes that cause the male to excel itself even in, in term, its own high standards of, of uh, sensational uh, headlines. And I'm not going to talk about nicotine. I'll defer to the nice public health guidance that Linda referred to, which looked at uh, health effects of nicotine and came to the conclusion that they were pretty modest. Uh, the only proviso on that is that we have no experience of the use of nicotine for inhalation other than in tobacco smoke. So we don't know whether nicotine is ha harmful to the lung uh, when used by humans in the long term. So what I want to look at is the other things that are in electronic cigarette uh, fluid and particularly the vapour. And so uh, this just reflects what, what you've already heard. Within electronic cigarette vapour, we have two groups of constituents. There's the things that should be there because they're in the fluid, so nicotine, propylene glycol, glycerine, and some flavours. And then there's what is generated either by metabolism or damage to those substances as they're in, uh, heated, or the products of the heating itself. So flavours in particular are a source of oxidant species in, the vapor, in electronic cigarette vapour. Metal particles find their way in there from the heating elements, uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, other potential carcinogens which have been, uh, which are certainly present in tobacco smoke, and a number of other compounds. Now, the, the list on the right is by no means comprehensive. It's just intended to give some flavour of what has been reported in different studies from around the world. Not in all, and as Charlotte has said, there is such variation in the source of the, of the vapour that it's very hard to be uh, general about what's in there. Generally, the range is much less, than, much less than tobacco smoke and levels also much lower. But when we think about what the harms of this might be, it's important to think of what happens to vapours or aerosols that are inhaled into the lung. So on the left here, you have a... Yeah, you have a... This is a scheme of somebody's uh, chest and, and the two lungs on either side and the larynx and central airway, the trachea here. And this is a, a radioisotope labelled distribution pattern of an inhaled drug, an asthma drug. And what you see there is that a huge amount of the stuff deposits in the back of the throat. And these are the large particles that come out of the device, probably the particles that you can see. And they get swallowed and they find their way into the stomach here. Other particles, smaller ones, are inhaled into the lungs. On the way down, many will deposit in the trachea and in the large airways here, and those will, for the most part, be expectorated back up and either swallowed or coughed and spat. The smallest particles will find their way out into the periphery of the lungs, into the alveolar tissues, where those in the sort of 2 to 5 micron range will deposit and may be absorbed. Even smaller ones, many of those, will be exhaled again. And of course, as this process is going on, the inhalation and exhalation, the droplets that come out of electronic cigarettes or any other uh, inhaler are evaporating. So they get smaller as they move through the respiratory system. So what we would expect is adverse effects that come from swallowing and then the absorption that goes on from the stomach and then excretion through the rest of the body and dire direct effects on the airways and then in the tissue of the lung. And the absorbed effects, which also happens with the very smallest particles in the lung, will also influence cardiovascular disease. So that's by way of background. Right, here we go. Here's the simplistic stuff. There's the same graphic. This is a chest x-ray. It's normal. It's mine. That's the heart. And these are the lung fields. Uh, when you inhale tobacco smoke, the droplets, the largest droplets that get into the lung, will deposit down the main airways and particularly on the points, the T-junctions in the airways. 
And there you have carcinogens depositing on the airway lining, and there you get cancers growing, such as this one growing probably on that junction there. The risk of cancer in smokers, as everybody knows, is pretty much linear. It's slightly more complicated than this, but right at the bottom end of the range, and this is from the 1952 first Dolan Hill study, uh, the more cigarettes you smoke, the more likely you are to die from lung cancer. Same for women, but the curve was slightly less steep in this study. So it doesn't, there is, the point is that there is no safe level of exposure. So any deposition of carcinogens in the lung is going to lead to lung cancer in some people. Well, what's in electronic cigarette vapour? Well, here we are, for example. This is uh, in electronic cigarette uh, vapour. Sorry, this is in liquid. This is uh, nitrosamines, total nitrosamines, compared with some tobacco products. And so what you see there is a level of nitrosamines that perhaps 0.02% of what's in tobacco. So very low levels. And similar, similar order of magnitude to, nic to nicotine replacement therapy. So unlikely to pose much of a hazard, though it, by inhalation, I repeat, we don't know. Here's one study looking at uh, levels of uh, aldehydes in electronic cigarette aerosols, and there were five in this review. There were two that gave us figures in milligrams per cubic metre of air. So if we take formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acrolyne, we have figures of you know, around the order of 10 milligrams per cubic metre. These are workplace exposure limits for the same uh, material, same chemicals, and they are in milligrams per mil of the order of 2.537, 0.23. So these figures are in the same order of magnitude, roughly. But of course, these are diluted by inhalation. So the levels that are exposed, or the lung is exposed, will be much lower than, than what is in the vapour here. But nevertheless, they're there. And although they are below workplace exposure limits, perhaps when they're inhaled, it's still a repeated sustained exposure for somebody, maybe for 16 hours a day. If we look at excretion of metabolites in urine, as Charlotte has mentioned, this study, this is in tobacco, so the dark bars are tobacco uh, and users, and the green bars are electronic cigarette users. Lower levels of carcinogens, particularly of the nitrosamines, than in smokers, but still appreciable levels. So carcinogens are getting in, and the stuff that's excreted is this, in, the kid, in the urine is the stuff that has been swallowed from the stomach. So it is spreading through the body. So, as I've said, the level, there is no safe level, but it will be somewhere down here that the risk of lung cancer lies with lifelong electronic cigarette use. And with tobacco, environmental tobacco smoke, the risk was about 1% of that of smoking, with this sort of exposure, who knows? It's going to be that order of magnitude, possibly lower, possibly a little more. It's not to say that it's a, a big risk, it's just that it's there. And furthermore, the amount of exposure will vary enormously according to the product. So again, as Charlotte has said, wide variation. These are nitrosamine levels in a range of different electronic cigarette brands. And we have values here that go from almost zero up to 45, 50 uh, I uh, can't remember what the concentration is, but eight was the, was the figure that I showed in the earlier study. So again, there's a huge range in how good these or how clean these products are. This is the risk of lung cancer if you stop smoking. Sorry, well, starting off with a smoker here, as they get older, from 40 to 80, this is the risk of dying from lung cancer. If you stop smoking in your mid-60s, the risk stops getting worse at that rate, but it continues to rise. Even if you stop in your 30s, you will end up with a double the risk of lung cancer to somebody who's never smoked. Electronic cigarette users are almost all ex-smokers. So even if the product doesn't cause cancer, companies that are selling these products are going to face legal claims from people who will argue, I stopped smoking a long time ago and I've got a cancer today. Have I got it from your product? There are carcinogens in there. Have you done all that you reasonably can to minimize those levels? It would be nice to think the answer to that question is yes. In the, the other major respiratory disease caused by inhaled tobacco smoke is what's called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's a blanket term for chronic bronchitis, which is a chronic productive cough, and emphysema, which is destruction of lung tissue. 
predominantly by oxidant activity in tobacco smoke. So here we have the same similar sort of diagram of the chest, but here we have large airways branching out in the airway, and eventually the very smallest airways at the end of this tree branching out into these clusters of air sacs or alveoli, a uh, very narrow wall around them, which allows oxygen to diffuse from the air inside into the network of blood vessels around it, and carbon dioxide to go in the opposite direction and be exhaled. When tobacco smoke comes into these spaces, it causes direct damage from oxidant activity, and so many of the particles that are in tobacco smoke will do the same thing. And if you look at one of those airways on the left here, you have a, a big open space surrounded by the airway wall and a little bit of folded tissue on the inside of it. And around it here, you have the alveolar sacs, which themselves are beautifully delicate, exquisite, very clever, beautifully designed structures, which is what's great about respiratory medicine. But also, the function of these structures is to support the airway wall here, so that when you breathe out and squeeze the lung, this airway doesn't just squash. Here you have the same sort of picture or level of section in somebody who has smoked a lot of cigarettes. The airway here is much narrowed. The lining of the airway is much thicker. It's full of inflammatory cells where the body is trying to get rid of this inhaled tobacco smoke insult. And around it, the alveoli have almost gone. So there's a loss of diffusion capacity in the lung. This is a CT scan, a cut through somebody's chest at about the heart level. These are normal lung tissues. If we take someone who's smoked for a fair few years, you see these little spaces appearing where the lung tissue has just been digested away. As time passes, it becomes more uh, diffuse, more, more sustained, uniform. And then in severe cases, you just have empty spaces where lung should be. This is damage caused by inhaling hot oxidant uh, chemically active substances. So if electronic cigarettes are doing any of this, so people will develop emphysema. Um, this is the oxidant activity in one study of electronic cigarette vapour um, measured in hydrogen peroxide equivalents. Um, here we have uh, the effects of air, propylene glycol, uh, glycerine, and then different electronic cigarette solutions. So there is accident, ox, sorry, oxidant activity being generated and it will cause chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And like uh, lung cancer, this is the risk of, lung, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as people get older. This is in current smokers, uh, former smokers and, ex, and never smokers. The risk doesn't uh, increase proportionately with the amount of exposure, so it will occur in people who are inhaling other unpleasant things. And when you stop smoking, this is what happens to lung function. Uh, the f this is the forced expiratory volume, the amount you can blow out of your lung in one second. Um, the blue line is uh, intermittent smokers. The green line is continuous smokers. The red line is people who quit here. And what you see is that the lung function improves ever so slightly and then starts to decline at about half the rate of a smoker. But nevertheless, if you've smoked for two or three decades, you are very much at risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in later life, and therefore the same applies with lung cancer. Those who are supplying products to people to use in this way are going to be hit with lawsuits saying, your product caused me to develop emphysema. I'm nearly done. There are other... Concerns for the lung, pulmonary fibrosis, which happens with inhaled metal dust, wood dust, oxidants, and a whole range of other insults to the lung, and pulmonary infection. This is a pneumonia at the base of the lung, which Charles Otter has spoken about. Again, inhaling particulates seems to drive that. Cardiovascular disease, um, this is the heart. This is one of the blood, blood vessels supplying the heart. Here's an area that's been narrowed by deposition of fat inside the wall of the artery, and that can narrow it so it occludes. But what more likely happens is that the artery becomes narrowed by these deposits, and then the blood flowing through it stick, is more sticky as a consequence of the effect of tobacco smoke, including inhaled nanoparticles. And that causes the blood to clot in this occluded area, and then the part of muscle supplied of the heart supplied by that artery dies, and that's a heart attack. Um, particles are a very important determinant of that. It's not the only one. Carbon monoxide and other toxins in smoke absorbed into the bloodstream also cause it. But here we have particulate levels in one study 
which Charlotte mentioned. Here we have PM uh, total suspended particles, particles less of 10 microns or less, 2.5 and 1. These are the ones that get inhaled into the lung. Levels in air after three minutes of use are substantially lower with electronic cigarette use, but still above European uh, World Health Organization guidance. So people who use electronic cigarettes regularly are dosing themselves with potentially with particulate pollution, which is at levels which we wouldn't accept in the, in the general atmosphere. Uh, this is just a sum. This report just demonstrates that with a 25 uh, micro... Uh, I've forgotten the units again now. Uh, however, with one unit of 25 micro, milligram, micrograms, milligrams per cubic metre increase, you have a roughly 5 to 10% increase in risk of total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and respiratory mortality. So that's there and it applies in users of these products. Uh, and the relationship between smoke exposure and cardiovascular disease, unlike the other two diseases I've covered, is not linear. You have a very steep increase in risk with very low levels of exposure, which is why passive smoking is so much more of an issue for cardiovascular disease than it is for lung cancer or COPD. And so very low levels of particulate or uh, nanoparticle exposure is going to put people somewhere on this steep part of the curve. So there will be an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is nanoparticle distributions in electronic cigarette vapour, and it just demonstrates that right at the bottom end, these are particles that are just absorbed directly into the bloodstream if they impact or inhaled, or inhaled in, in other substances and, and trigger some of that coagulation response. Finally, the things that are supposed to be in electronic <laughs> cigarette vapour, well, ethylene, propylene glycol, so far as I can tell, the safety data for long-term use come from 16, I think, monkeys which lived in a cage for 18 months in the 1950s, and when they were, obviously with their consent, they were killed, and then their lungs were sliced up, uh, and they looked all right. Um, this is respiratory symptoms and exposure to theatrical smoke, which is propylene glycol, and just shows that with cumulative exposure, this is in hours of milligrams per cubic metre, you have an exposure response relationship with some of these symptoms, which tend to go with asthma. So it's not inert, but nevertheless. We have occasional case reports of respiratory problems. Charles has mentioned these. This was a lipoid pneumonia. I don't know how credible that was. And this is a hypersensitivity pneumonia, nickel, chromium, some of the other metals in electronic cigarette vapour are allergens and will provoke an allergic reaction just as some people get a skin rash if they wear cheap jewellery. Uh, if that goes on in the lung, you end up with inflamed patches in the lung. There are one or two case reports of this. Very, they haven't been repeated and I suspect this, is, this can be discounted. Um, the risk of the swallowed uh, metabolites, the swallowed carcinogens, we can take a lesson from SNUS, which contains far more nitrosamines, probably far more other carcinogens. We have an increased risk of pancreatic tumours, perhaps, uh, and we have the risks of bladder cancer and kidney cancer and so on from sustained excretion of, of hazardous substances. So just to put all that together... My expectation is that if we have a population of people using electronic cigarettes for decades rather than months or a year or two, we will see an increase in risk of lung cancer, modest but real, uh, emphysema and COPD the same, increased infections, cardiovascular events, possibly pulmonary fibrosis, possibly hypersensitivity pneumonias and other systemic cancers. All of these risks will be substantially lower than tobacco smoking, so it's a no-brainer that if you're a smoker, you should switch, but using the product long-term will carry a risk, and I think it's incumbent on the people who are selling these products to smokers to make sure their product is as low risk as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, as he can't stay for the panel, we will take one or two questions. So please put your hands up so I can see them. Okay, we've got one there, and then Ricardo. Okay, those two. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi. Um, your review uh, doesn't take account of the evolution of the product. We are learning so many things these days that we know how to abate aldehydes, how to abate formaldehydes by just temperature control or just by informing users to, to fill their tanks properly and to keep them. So I, I think 
the probably is an oversimplistic view. What do you think, John? Uh, it was certainly a very simplistic view. I'll give you that. Um, my point is not that these technical, technological developments aren't in train or cannot be achieved. My point is that they need to be, and as quickly and as reasonably possible. We find ourselves, many of us, arguing continuously that electronic cigarettes are safer than cigarettes, and therefore it's a very positive thing for public health. Well, I find myself, Charlotte perhaps doesn't, but I find myself arguing it's a very positive thing for public health. But we have to be responsible about that and recognise that, that we cannot assume that much lower risk is no risk. That's all I'm saying. And so, with a pro either through regulation or through technological development, and ideally both, we end up with products that have the minimum levels of nitrosamines and the minimum levels of all of these other toxins in there. And then, when people selling those products are in court explaining why it's not their fault that someone has developed lung cancer, they'll be able to say, we did everything we could. OK, um, I've got two I've seen, and then we'll have to stop. So we'll take the questions together. We can get a mic to the back, Constantinus, and then um, I'll give John a final word. Thank you. Hi, Catherine Deblin from Aceta. Hello, John. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, the last slide that you showed with that the, you're going to expect this increased uh, ongoing risk, yeah. residual risk, not yeah. increased, but residual risk of lung cancers and so on increasing in society. Yeah. Does that apply to never smokers yeah. taking up e-cigarettes, or are you only talking really about the fact that there is a residual risk for those people who smoked for decades okay, right. before no, switching? I'm, I'm sorry, I probably blurred those points. The risk is for everybody. Uh, it's a multiplier of your baseline risk. Now, if you're a fit, healthy, middle-aged person or young person, your baseline risk is incredibly low, so multiplying it up a lot doesn't matter. But over a lifetime, that's not the case. The other point that smoke most of the people who use electronic cigarettes are ex or or dual users ex smokers certainly those who are ex smokers have, are not waving goodbye to their cumulative risk and if you start with a higher risk of a disease at, before you start using another product and that product multiplies up the risk a little further it can generate a lot of cases so all i'm saying is that there is a potential risk and, and disease burden building up in society over time, there's also a liability for that. Um, and Constantine, it's very short, please. Yes, a very short one. Uh, John, a, a comment and probably a correction. You talked about uh, metabolites, biomarkers of exposure in the urine. Yeah. And you said that in e-cigarette users, they exist, they don't become zero. Uh, we have to understand that even in never smokers, these metabolites exist in urine. And there is a simple reason why this is happening. Because of environmental exposure, either from the environmental pollution or from cooking food, which contains polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and so on. So the levels that were found in exclusive e-cigarette users were the same as never smokers. They are there, but they are also there in e-cigarette smokers, in, in uh, never smokers. I, th I agree that we're talking about very small levels of risk, and it's possible that all of that excre excretion in that particular study, which didn't have a control group, um, is attributable to environmental exposures. But if you know that there's, you know, if you know there's a trout in the milk, somebody's watering it down. If there's, if there's to toxins in the vapour and people are excreting toxins and maybe de developing toxin-related disease, it's very hard to argue it wasn't my product.